Welcome back to another high-level match of StarCraft 2. What I've got for you today is a best of three series of Protoss versus Zerg. We're in game number one in the top left hand corner of the map. We have the current number 14 in the world overall. We're looking at none other than Classic's main Nexus. His opponent playing with the blue Zerg drones. Someone I haven't featured on the channel in a while ever since he changed his nickname. I mean, I've ranted about this in the past. I think it's a really bad idea to change your username as a pro gamer. But anyways, playing right here with the blue Zerg pieces, we have the current number 13 in the world. And he goes by the name of Shin. Well, at the very least, these days, he goes by the name of Shin. You may be well familiar with his nickname, Ragnarok. Ragnarok, of course, earlier this year ended up, well, for example, eliminating Serral out of the World Championships. He ended up, well, <laughs> he lost in the semifinals of the World Championships against Maru, which obviously, yeah, respectable result, right? Getting top four at the World Championships is not bad at all. But it was a little bit sour, I guess, for Ragnarok or for Shin, because he also lost in the Grand Finals of the GSL Code S last year against Maru too. So that was a little bit frustrating for him, I suppose. But in the end, he's one of the very best Zerg players that we have. But he decided to change his nickname. Now, in general, I just don't think it's a great idea to change your nickname as a pro gamer, because you're already kind of... You know, faceless? I, I mean, that sounds really mean, but I, I, don't have, I don't have the pro gamer faces in the game. The best way to recognize somebody is by their username, and I guess their playstyle, and it's not like Ragnarok's playstyle is particularly spicy. It's He plays very normal StarCraft. He generally doesn't play super aggressive, although lately I have seen him go for a bunch of timing attacks. So we'll see We'll see how this, uh, how this happens. By the way, as far as I understand, so he played under the name of, I think it's pronounced Hebom, or... How do you... Pro I, I think it's that, actually. Hebom? Uh, that's an ID he played under as well for a little while. That's one of his names. And apparently Shin is, I think, his family name. So, yeah, he's decided to uh, change from Ragnarok, which may be just a little bit too edgy to an... I don't know, to an aging programmer. I wish I knew why he changed his name, you know? Maybe he's got a good reason. Or maybe he's just sick and tired of being called Ragnarok. But Ragnarok is kind of cool, right? I think we can get on board with that. Anyways, Mr. Classic sending his very first adept towards the other side of the map, being a bit of a jerk here to his opponent's third base. Fair enough. Should go up, though, before that adept arrives, and as long as that happens, I don't think Shin is gonna be all too upset. Classic, by the way, a pro gamer with, well, like, a, a career of over 10 years at this point, so I just looked it up. I kind of forgot about this, but Classic won a GSL Code S back in 2014. That's back when the prize pool for the GSL was also quite significant. He's, by the way, opening up with a Void Ray first here, so... That's a bit of an interesting start, we can talk about that in just a moment, but... That's back when the GSL Code has at like, $70,000 first place prize. He also won an SSL in 2015. He got second place at IAM Karavitsa, where he lost against Rogue in the Grand Finals. Rogue currently doing his military service, secretly hoping that he will be coming back, I actually think. No, that was Parting. Parting is supposed to be wrapping up, I think, his military service right around this time. Like, right around December 2013? Or 2023, rather? Anyways, all these dates, they're confusing me. He does decide to commit right here with the Adepts. Not in love with it at all. So far, just a single worker just on the tail end of that particular engagement. Lastly, I think it's worth noting that Classic also got to the semi-finals of the StarCraft II Global Finals in 2019. Then he went off to the military. And, uh, yeah, we didn't see him for, uh, like, 18 months. Took him a little bit after coming back from his mandatory military service to get back to the professional level, but he's been looking solid as of late. So, the number 13, 13, going up against the number 14. I know somebody always said, 40, loco? F 13, no. 13. Maybe I mispronounced those words. Or maybe it's just English. English can be a uh, yeah, English can be a little bit funny. Void Ray start. Um, I haven't really talked about the game all too much, mostly just because... Oh, he didn't mineral walk it. Uh, mostly because, yeah, everything is pretty much normal, right? We've had uh, a little bit of variety as far as the very first Stargate unit goes. Oracle, in the meantime, trying to get some work done on the other side of the map, but not really achieving all too much. I'm not a huge fan of Void Ray first. I think overall it is weaker than straight Oracle, but there's no denying that... Did he just lose the Oracle? No way. What did you try to do with it, Classic? You just decided to fly back in at 5 health. Is that what you decided to do? I thought he was surely gonna recall it. Is this actually... Oh, 
he should have moved it. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, he was gonna recall it. He should have moved it ever so slightly to the left. Okay, this is not a great start right here for Classic. Losing uh, an Oracle right there, going Void Ray first, which slows down your aggression quite a bit, and then also two Adepts. That is a bit of a bad start. And yeah, Shin is immediately utilizing just as much an economy as possible. So he's going into a lair. Going into an Evo Chamber, going into a Roach Warren, and now he's adding on four additional gases. Is this just going to be a good old Roach push? So the upgrades should at the very least, assuming he starts a plus one missile, there it is. These upgrades should all finish up right around the same time. And this is tricky, so one of the problems you run into with a Void Ray opener is that you can't really scout very easily, right? Like, yeah, you don't really die, you can't really lose to an early game attack, and maybe you can kill an Overlord or two if you're lucky. But overall, it is kind of difficult to get proper damage done, right? And third base, at the very least, is reasonably timed, but it looks like one of the Zealots is not on hold position. Hmm, not in love with this. Archon's being morphed in over here in the bottom left hand corner. Shin, by the way, should really be firing up the Roach speed. Instead, he decides to go Hydra then. Okay. That's a bit of an interesting one to me. We've seen a lot of Roach speed pushes over the years in StarCraft 2. Back in the early days, obviously, a Roach Hydra was a very common unit comp. There's finally the Roach speed. These days, the more common choice is to go, if you want to counter, say, for example, a Void Ray, the more common choice is just to bring the Queens across. He doesn't really have that many workers. Fourth Hatchery is coming up. He's making non-stop army here for a little bit already. By the way, this is an attack before charge is done. God, this is painful, man. If you're a classic fan, I... I like, I'm not having a good time here, as, as a fan of Classic. This is very painful of a start. Seven Zealots go down. He killed a bunch of Zorklings in this game, but that's not really the unit he has to be concerned by. He, or concerned off, I guess. He decides to go for the speed upgrade for the Hydralisks first. I've got a feeling what you can do right now as Shin is just attack. Like, I would, if I was Shin here in this scenario, I would 100% attack. These upgrades are gonna allow his units significant power spikes. You can just march straight to the other side of the map. Maybe you knock down these rocks and just bring the queens. Why not bring the queens as well? Really no reason to continue droning at this point. This is what happens when Protoss has a bad start. They donate one too many units. Mistakes are made. You attack right before charge is done. Oh, it becomes very painful. And a fourth Nexus. There's no way. Finish him, Shin. Do it. No, 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 no. Classic! What in the world? No, if you're gonna play like this, you're gonna drop down to, you know, 40 rather than 14. Ay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, this has gotta be one of the uh, lowest high level games that I've casted recently. Okay, everybody gets an off day, everybody gets an off game, but it does mean that you lose to just a good old Roach Hydra attack. <laughs> Now, of course, that's the reason why we play series in StarCraft 2. If you play a horrible game one, you're still gonna be able to, hopefully at the very least, play a slightly better game number two. Shin opening up here with a 15 supply hatchery on the low ground. Apparently a fan of that extractor trick opener. It does work well on this map, even if the Protoss probe is sent across right at the very start, you can still get that expansion going. Well. At least if you micro your drones a little bit on the mineral fields as well, you can still get it going without all too much trouble. Bit of a different follow-up here, though. Yeah, I was gonna say, generally this is not what the follow-up looks like. Normally you go for a spawning pool first and then a gas eventually. It's a little bit of a later spawning pool here too, so I guess that Shin really just wanted to make sure he was not gonna get his natural expansion blocked. I didn't pay attention to that in game number one, but maybe him going for a 15... Yeah, like a 15 supply hatchery on the low ground is just his go-to at this point. It is very annoying. I actually really hate it. Whenever I play Zerk and I get my natural expansion blocked, I'm forced to go for my third base first. It's not that it's not playable, it's just really annoying. Things like, for example, a Twilight Council opener, right? Say, for example, into Glaive the Depths. When your third base is disconnected and you have to, like, kind of micro multiple bases at the same time, I find especially Glaive the Depth the text to be very difficult to stop. Anyhow, what's going on right now on the side of the Protoss? Nothing all too crazy. We've got ourselves a standard opener, double gas right now in the main base, and we'll have to see what sort of text structure he decides to plant down in a moment. That being said, this is classic, so it's gonna have to be a Stargate. 
I mean, that's what he does, like, 9 out of 10 games anyways. Yeah. On a map like this, when he's 1-0 behind, I think it makes perfect sense to open up with his Stargate once again. Will he be going for a Void Array first? Is he going to sacrifice his first two Adepts? Is he then also going to lose his Oracle, right? Those are the questions I'm, I'm more curious about. It's not like his strategy was bad in the previous game, it's just that his execution was subpar. The little things, man, they really add up in a game of StarCraft 2. I can't emphasize that enough. Every time you see a, a Protoss player losing an Adept, that's a cue for Zerk to add on a couple more drones. And when you lose a whole lot of stuff early on, you're going up against the Zerk, who's literally just holding down the drone button, because they don't need to make any defensive units. And if they don't need to make any defensive units, their economy is going to be booming. Like, ah, I think in that previous game, maybe like 30, 45-ish seconds earlier than they ordinarily would be. And that just gives Zerk so much income. You just have to... You just end up dealing with like maybe 10 to 15 roaches more than he otherwise would have to deal with. Like the numbers are that extreme. So playing a clean early game is absolutely critical because you fall behind too fast. Like the eventual timing attack, it just gets too powerful. Even when it's a bit of a weird one with a Hydralisk switch. I would have liked to see where that was going if the game went on for a little bit longer. Maybe this game is going to give us a bit more info. It is once again a Void Ray first. It is once again going to be a third Nexus nice and early. It is once again going to be an Oracle follow-up. The main change so far is that it's these two Adepts, they actually, they live. Maybe what happened is that he accidentally did not cancel it, right? So he's not actually gone for the, the base yet. Hmm. Normal timing for the base is 345. Yeah, now we're at 410. See, I'm not in love with that. It's not bad. It doesn't really matter that much. Obviously, he gets to warp in some extra stuff if he really wants to, but... Ooh. Really? Is it because we prioritize the gases? I think it may just be. That's why that expansion was a little bit later. I wonder if Shin picked up on that as well. Fleet Beacon coming up. There's a very good chance that Shin is looking at this series. So he's like, yo, my opponent? He's not playing all too great. Um, maybe... <laughs> maybe... He just, you know, he's playing so poorly that his entire build is 20 seconds delayed. And that could explain why everything is delayed, right? Like his third base is certainly not at the optimal timing. It certainly could be possible that this fleet beacon is not anticipated at this time. I've seen Classic play this build. Um, it's where he goes for a bunch of Tempests. So he rushes out Tempests in the earlier stages of the game. Super annoying, especially once the Tempest numbers go up to about 5. Oracle, by the way, getting some work done over here. Okay, three kills. Don't lose the Oracle, please. No. Oh my god, that was greedy. I... Mm, okay, you know what? I don't mind it. I don't love it either. Oh, this is actually not Tempest. It's a Carrier Rush. I have seen this recently. I don't remember exactly if it was classic. I was not in love with this opener like I am in love with the Tempest. The thing is, once you get to like 5 Tempest, you can basically one-shot everything. But the problem with waiting until you have 5 Tempest is that you lose against any sort of Spire start for the Zerg. So, if Shin finishes up the lair, goes instantly into a Spire, <laughs> he's gonna be... Yeah, uh, don't, don't show them yet. Uh, Classic would be in a lot of trouble if he goes up against a... Uh, a Zork player who goes... Yeah, okay, there's the Spire. Okay, so carriers turn out to be a much better choice. Are we gonna wait until we have four, or are we gonna attack right at two? Looks like we're gonna go straight out. Okay. Unit on the Watchtower is providing vision here. Zorkling is gonna attempt to scout what's going on. Will this get spotted? I don't think so. Nope. Nicely done right there. At this point, these carriers are unscouted. That being said, though, it's two carriers. By default, Zerk will have seven to eight queens. Two carriers pack a bit of a punch, but if they're fighting on a spore crawler and the queens can come together, I don't think it really matters that much. I would like to see the Void Ray maybe joining in as well, but I think it's being kept at home to deal with a potential Zerkling run by. And Shin is being relentless with those. Yeah, making it difficult to commit with everything. Okay. So... Man, we could definitely get the cancel on the fourth base, I would imagine. Really? We want more than that classic? No, this is not where we fight. What are we looking for, uh, classic? It's like we're on a tour, man. Like, this is the tour bus right over here. We're going sightseeing on the other side of the map. We're doing carrier drone harass. Is that what we're doing? <laughs> 
Yeah, I kind of hate it. I'm sorry. It looks cool and impressive. Eh. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of low HP units. He's actually transfusing drones. <laughs> How many times have I casted a Mech Specs game where Mech Specs goes triple Oracle first and he gets like 20 worker kills? And you're like, ah, everybody should be doing this. Classic fully committed into drone harassment in this game. One saving grace, I guess, for him is that he's forced his opponent to go into Corruptors. And there's only two carriers. So this was just two carriers to harass the opponent. I'm assuming he did see... No, he did not even... S no, he did see the Spire. I was going to say, I thought I had it on the camera. Uh, it wasn't a main base. The Spire, I guess, now is enabling Corruptors to come up. These Corruptors are only useful against carriers, and that's about it. There's Storm. Can we get some Storms done? I mean, carriers are certainly going to go down. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> it's cool, I guess. But is it good? That's the question. I mean, it's going to be really hard for Shin to win at this stage in the game. He's going to try and go for a bit of a bulldozer attack, it seems. Lots of roaches, ravagers, another corruptor for some reason. I'm not sure why that one's there. Problem is, on this map, there's a lot of choke points, right? So pushing up this ramp is tricky. Zerk, I guess, prefers fighting over here, but why would Classic allow that engagement? So we'll probably see a fight over here in this choke point or up this ramp. And I'm not a fan of either of those two spots. Classic does have uh, Blink available. Doesn't use it, though, but that's okay. Is there enough here for the Zerk? I don't think so. Nah, Storm is going to be amazing. Okay. He's trying to get an engagement in. Which is fair enough. He's still doubling down. He's still making a lot of units. Well, maybe he can break through this. He's starting to get the jump right now on the Immortals. Immortals are certainly the most pivotal unit here, other than the High Templar themselves. Battery overcharge not achieving all too much. Missile attacks level 1 finishes up right after the brunt of that engagement. Aggressive blink forward here as well from Classic. I think this is A-OK -okay for the Protoss. Very nicely done. One problem here for Shin is that he's got so much supply caught up in Corruptors, and they're not really achieving anything. Would love to have seen them maybe try and use their Caustic Spray ability on anything, really? Just to try and put on some additional pro like uh, additional pressure rudder on the Protoss. Yeah, now they're gonna do it. <laughs> Come on, man. Yeah, that ain't it. That ain't it, dude. That's like my ladder games now. It's like, oh yeah, I forgot about that ability. Let me do it after the fight. Well, it could have been, uh, could have been possible, I guess. Very quick storm, by the way. So it was straight into carrier, straight into storm. Interesting start. Good focus on upgrades here as well. One thing I would really like to see is that focus on air weapons. What we have seen, Mr. Raynor do. Unironically, I actually think Raynor's style in Protoss vs. Zerg, so Raynor, in case you don't watch literally every single video I upload, uh, Raynor's been playing a bunch of Protoss as of late, and the way he plays Protoss is very interesting to me. It is, in a way, almost unexplored territory. Like, it's a heavy focus on probes, a heavy focus on upgrades, and just controlling the battlefield, you know? Like, you see the way that Classic has been playing after those carriers? He's just sitting there and he's absorbing punches. Right? So he's sitting there, and his opponent is the one who's in charge of the fight. Now he's going across the map with his entire army in one big ball, and he's gonna try and throw some punches, but in general, I think Zerg should be able to push this back. Well, maybe he can get some work done. Would like to see the top-level Protosses. Oh, good storms over here. Yeah, I mean, this is a really big fight. Is there enough for the Zerg to break through this? I think there is. Yeah, should be. Not in love with that fight there for Classic. The problem is, if you if you fight into, like, one big ball like that... Zerk can just focus their efforts on defending in one location, right? Oh, Prism even goes down right there to the Biles. Yeah, that style that, uh, that Raynor has been playing is very interesting to me. So it's very different than this classical approach, I guess, that Classic is currently going for. I actually think it's better. It's just also much harder to play, right? So, in those games that we've seen Raynor play Protoss, he's literally 5-600 APM. Top tier Protosses that I regularly cast on the channel are not even remotely close to that. And APM does not equal skill. 
And I understand there's a lot of wasted actions and a lot of speed that, you know, is still present. But there's no denying that it's an indicator, at the very least, of how fast somebody plays. Shin right now coming around the right side of the map. Gonna be able to shut down the uh, battery overcharge before it even happens. And getting the kill on this base would actually be really quite nice for him. That golden base has already gone down. Corrosive Biles on the way out, and that's another Nexus down the drain. Yeah, that fight right there for Classic was not ideal. But, you know what? One thing Classic does have right now is 86 workers. If he would have kept one of those bases alive, the advantage that he's got actually would be almost a bit overwhelming, I think, for Zerk. Right now, the economy is not that great. Oh, Zerkling just managed to sneak around, but Photon Cannon is going to be able to shut that scout. We really need to see some Cybercore upgrades. Carriers have been restarted. And I think that could have been at nearly plus two at this point in the game. That's such a significant power spike. Storms once again. Oh my god, on the Banelings. Not really a lot of value right there this time around for Shin. Bailing's coming around the side as well, going after Stalkers, certainly suboptimal. Blink backwards over here? Okay, this fight is ten times better for Classic. Lovely stuff. Fighting and chasing these Zerg units to the best of his abilities. Hyphen, in the meantime, is coming up. Corruptors! Trying their very best to finish off the carrier, but not going to happen. Or not going to happen. Shin's upgrade relatively late. Would not mind seeing him expand towards the left side of the map, because Protoss is starting to take up shop once again with a double expand on the right. This expansion is still super low as well, so it might not be a terrible idea to at the very least consider taking some bases all the way on the left side. He's got some money for it. Good counsel over here on that base, though. That's just plus one Zerklings. Classic did not anticipate those units coming across, and that helps out quite a bit. Yeah, another plus one air weapon start up. Greater Spire in the meantime, morphing in as well on the other side of the map. Brute Lords are gonna be a really nice tool, I think, in the arsenal here for, for Shin, but... He's gotta be careful. The carrier count is slowly growing. Right now we only have two of them, or, yeah, two of them coming up at a time. Soon we'll have six in total. Against six... You can, yeah, I think you can still make Brute Lords do decently well. It becomes a bit of an issue when the Protoss army is very Skytos dominant, right? When more and more of that supply for our Protoss player gets caught up in carriers. Brute Lords obviously aren't as helpful. A unit that is very helpful though, especially with full armor upgrades, is the Ultralisk. Ultra is actually surprisingly good against Skytos. I've been loving them actually in my own games. To the point where I've been losing a lot of games too because I'm too focused on Ultras. Uh, okay, should be able to keep this alive, just barely. Yeah, Adrenal starts up right now. Okay, once again, big fight over here. Storms are gonna be absolutely critical. Okay, Bailing's over here, rolling into Stalkers. Not in love with that, no splits though from Classic, so that was the most amount of splash damage that these units could deal. Biles are going down on whatever it can hit as well. Corruptors coming in, trying to go after as many of these carriers as possible. I like this fight here for, uh, for Shin. Not only does he, well, take out a lot of important units for the Protoss, but he should also be able to now make a couple of Brute Lords here, if he wants to, right? You need to open up supply for that. Apparently he's not 100% convinced. Those Stalkers chasing down quite a few of the Corruptors right there and near the till end of that fight. I think that actually ended up uh, being a lot better there for the Protoss than it originally was supposed to be. Yeah, now three carriers are coming up all at the same time. There's the Ultras. Yeah, if you would have told me a decade ago that Ultras are rarely played against Protoss other than against Skytos, <laughs> I would have made fun of you, because that just doesn't make any sense. Why would the biggest ground unit for Zerg be good against flying Protoss units? Well, it turns out, with full armor upgrades, so, I mean, with Carapace as well as Chitinous Plating, the Ultralisk doesn't really die. It takes forever to kill a fully upgraded Ultralisk as a Protoss player. Because of that, they're usually very good at either the main fight, right? So you can just send in the Ultras, carriers are gonna tickle them, doesn't really deal a lot of damage. You can kill the High Templar, you can kill, for example, Disruptors, you can kill Archons, at which point the Corruptors can swoop in and kill all of the actual flying units. So that's option one for Ultralisks. Option two, use them for counterattacks. That's what we see Serral using them for all the time. So he will send like groups like this, 
to watch the other side of the map, to fight in a location. And Zerklings, yeah, they kind of suck against photon cannons and all that, but Ultras absolutely demolish static defense. High Templar, by the way, the only units that can recall. Very brave recall right here from Classic, but it looks like he will be rewarded for now! Well, I say that, these guys are gonna get chomped to death for sure. Here's once again, though, Corruptor swooping in. Couple extra Stormers would not be a bad spot right here, but apparently the probes are gonna run and they will at the very least stay alive for now. Big Warpins over here, very chaotic battles, but ultimately, I think that Shin will be pushed back. Yeah. Hmm. That looked so much worse than it actually was. It wasn't great, don't get me wrong, but Shin doesn't really have that much of an economy. He's only on 74 workers himself, and he's throwing a lot of units at the wall? But he's not achieving that much. Now, he did, by the way, eventually take this base over here on the left pretty late. Yeah, drones are transferring to that spot right now. But notice the distinct lack of spellcasters here for the Zerk. This reminds me a little bit of that Sue type of style, right? Remember the Zerk player Sue? He still competes, actually. Not as much as I would like him to, but... Um, Sue used to basically play StarCraft 2 in a very swarmy way with Zerk and rarely mix in spellcasters. I like the style that Shin plays, but I don't think it's optimal. Especially when you're starting to run out of minerals, this is the time, at least, preferably earlier, to start mixing in either Infestors or Vipers or even both. It's just that it makes the unit composition also significantly harder to control. It's very tempting to just... Send in the skeletons, right? Send in the skeleton! Yeah, s send them in. Don't be a pretender. Just send them all going. Alright. Plus three air weapons coming up here as well for Classic. Classic sitting back, taking the punches. We may very well see a Zealot run by here eventually. Would have not minded seeing those going around a little, a little while ago. They're fully upgraded, so... They certainly pack a punch other than, I guess, their armor. Looks like a Zerkling here does scout roughly what's going on. This base is never going to happen, at least unless, <laughs> unless Shin lets it. You should be able to kill that pretty easily. But yeah, Shin is not making a transition towards like higher tier units. Rather than spending his gas on Infestors or Vipers, he's decided to drop his gas bank on as many Banelings as possible. I think this is essentially the final max out here for our Zerk. The question is, can he get an engagement in that he's happy with? Because Classic is getting to the point where his army is near unstoppable. He does need a couple Archons, though. I was gonna say, uh, Archons here in the mix would be really nice. And look at these Ultras go, man. Ultras swooping in, killing every unit on the ground. Corruptors coming in as well, destroying as many of those carriers as possible. I think the carrier numbers themselves may just barely be sufficient. Ultras in the meantime, gone in, and this is what I'm talking about, man. This is why I like Ultras against Skytals quite a bit. As funny as it is, they just don't die. Like, carriers just take forever killing a bunch of Ultras. And these aren't even fully upgraded Ultras. These are upgrades, uh, these, these are Ultras with only plus one armor. Look at them, they're still getting tickled. Now imagine if every single one of those interceptor shots dealt minus two damage. In addition to how much they're currently dealing. They would not die. There's actually a minimum amount of damage that Zerk uh, or, or Starcraft units in general can take. The minimum damage apparently is 0.5. Because, technically speaking, you could take negative damage with full armor upgrades, uh, which uh, ends up being a little bit of a funky math equation. Be interesting if carriers would attack Ultras and they're actively healing the Ultralisks. I think that probably was one of the bugs that the Blizzard development team ran into when they made this game. So they set a minimum damage output of units of 0.5, which makes a lot more sense. Now, despite the fact, though, that Shin took a good fight there and he dealt a lot of damage and he killed a base and he, like, got rid of his opponent's Skytol's army, at least for the most part, this is still a Protoss army that is trading, yeah, cost-efficiently compared to the Zerg. I mean, this is not as bad as I actually expected it to be. It's only, like, two and a half thousand more minerals, eh, a little bit more gas, nothing all too crazy. It's just that Shin has never really had that 85-plus drone economy that we would really love to see with a style like this. He's currently sitting on only 60 workers, and he's gonna run out of steam. This is not a longevity unit composition, right? Like, this is not an army that he can just play for the next five minutes. Like, this is an army that goes in, it dies, you replace it. I guess the strategy right now for Shin is to try and bleed his opponent out. Which could work. It's just that I don't think Classic is going to allow it. 
Classic already going after some of the bases all the way in the left side of the map. A four zealot run by. Very conservative, but he doesn't have that much money himself either. The Skytel's army is growing though. We're getting to the point right now. Yeah, there's seven carriers versus 11 corruptors. More corruptors are coming. Queens obviously are also available on the ground, but they've been pulled away from their hatcheries because times are looking pretty uh, dire at this point. There's not a whole lot that Zerk has remaining. I'm not liking this game for Zerk. I mean, maybe it's okay. I want to believe, but I think we all have seen many games like this where the Zerk army just sort of fizzles out over time. And that's exactly why Kletzik is playing this so conservatively, right? Like, he doesn't really need to go and make a big move onto Creep again like he did earlier on when it went wrong. He doesn't really need to do that. As long as he can deny these bases over here, Zerk should run out of juice eventually. Here's another push. Corruptor count is pretty big, though. We're gonna need to see either some Storms or some Archons underneath. I would love to see, like, three more Archons in the mix right here for Classic, just to help him shield against these Corruptors. Okay, Storms are going down on the Carriers as well as the Corruptors. Shin decides to make a dive into that ball to make it difficult for those High Templar to deal damage, but it's not going to happen. It's Classic who obtains the victory in game number two. Our final game for today, it takes place on the map site Delta. Classic once again decided to send a probe straight towards the other side of the map at the start of the game. Shin, however, went for a 14 hatch on the low ground, so incredibly fast hatchery. This man currently really does not enjoy getting his expansion blocked. It does make the game a little bit funky. I guess you have a little bit more variety in your early game than you really want to see as a Zerk, but it doesn't really matter all that much, right? Apparently, he much prefers having a bit of a messy ah, first 30 supply or so compared to getting his expansion blocked and being forced to take the third base. In the meantime, on the other side of the map, everything's normal right here for Classic. Nexus on the low ground, followed up by a Cybercore. One of the reasons why we see Protoss players scout very early is that if this would be a pool first opener, not very common in the current meta, but just on the off chance that it would be, you want to know whether or not you need to put down the Cybercore first or the Nexus. So usually in a standard game against Hatch first, you go Nexus into a Cybercore, but if you see your opponent goes for a pool first, usually the norm is to go for a Cybercore into a Nexus. And if you need to, you could go second gateway, Cybercore, and then, well, probably want to delay the Nexus a little bit because you won't have money. Because you need to probably start up a Zealot as well against, like, a 12 pool opener or something along those lines. And then you need to add on a pylon as well, which further delays your Nexus. Long story short, that's why that Probe Scout, though, is very handy. Even though it very frequently doesn't seem to achieve much. It's just one of those, I don't want to die to anything stupid type of starts. Starting at opener here once again for Classic. Will we see a Void Ray once again? Apparently he's really liking the Void Ray at the moment. I'm not sure about the Void Ray myself. I'm really, I don't know. Whenever I see a Void Ray start, I always immediately think they're trying to hide something. And maybe I'm mistaken, because the Void Ray, like, it denies any sort of scouting whatsoever, right? So when I see a Void Ray first, I'm like, okay, what are you up to, buddy? Keep your secrets, I don't care. So I play very safe when somebody goes Void Ray first, because it feels like they're trying to do something that needs to be hidden. And there's once again a Void Ray coming up. What exactly can you hide? Yeah, I would say Glyph the Depths is probably the scariest thing. You could also go for like, I don't know. There's, there's a bunch of variety, right? Like there's a lot of different things that can come out of that Protoss base. I think it's one of those things where on paper, an Oracle opener can deal more damage. And on paper, a Void Ray first is not that scary for the Zerg. However, in reality, in a real game of StarCraft, this creates a lot more chaos in the side, or, or in, in, inside of the head of the Zerg player, you know? Like, you play against these, you're like, oh god. Well, now I'm in the darkness again. No clue what I'm playing against. Look at the vision right here of Shin. He knows, well, about very little. He'll probably send a Ling across the map here in a moment to get some vision of a third base of his opponent. Oh, looks like we had a bit of a break. Sorry, ready, go, go, go. I think somebody probably lagged out there for just a moment. One of the observers. All right. So last game, we saw a third Nexus going up at 410 or so. And that was in combination with a very quick fleet beacon. In this game, instead, we have a Twilight Council. 
As long as he starts up the Nexus, it's gonna be difficult for the Zerg player to figure out exactly what's happening. Although this is a four and a half minute Nexus, okay. That is very fishy. So, this is going to be Glaive the Dept. The main question you need to ask yourself as a Zerg player is how many workers do I want to make before I start making army, right? So he doesn't know precisely what he's playing against, but he knows that something is a little fishy. This is a lot of workers. Shin is a braver man than I am. I would stop droning at like 48. He's gonna go straight up to like 56? No, he's eight. Whoa, he's adding on more? What? Really? He's even going into a lair too. No Roach Warren, no nothing. He's cutting a corner. He thinks this is a fake. He probably thinks this is the same build that Classic showed in game number two. Because that's what it looks like. So, like so far, everything he's seen looks basically identical, other than maybe with like five to ten extra seconds or so on that Nexus. Maybe 15 seconds on that Nexus. Compared to the second game in this series. Yeah. I think he's trying to rush out a Spire. So instead, ay yeah, 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 yeah. This is, well, like a dozen Glaive to Depths moving across the map. Shin is still making drones. He is having a complete misread. Beautiful move, of course, here by Classic. This is exactly, again, why we play a series. Game number one, pretty rough one for Classic. Game number two, he showed a very similar start to what we have over here, but an entirely different follow-up. And now in game number three, he's telling the story that this is definitely, once again, a quick double Stargate, Fleet Beacon type of opener. And then he hits his opponent in the face with a lot of Glaive the Depth here instead. Shin has decided, okay, I don't really need to worry about it. I can cut corners. I don't need a Roach Warren. So far, this has not been absolutely atrocious for him, because he overmade so many drones that he can afford losing quite a few of them too. Yeah, maybe it's manageable. I still think we're gonna see a shade here at some point, though, that will murder an entire mineral line. I guess the one thing that he does have going for him here, Shin at least, is that there's no prism to quickly reinforce this. But this is like step one in a multi-layered attack here from Classic. Additional adepts are showing up right now over at the third base as well. You guys aren't reapers, you can't go up. You can, well, harass the mineral line instead, but apparently it's not even needed. The series, it goes in favor of Classic. Hey, if you enjoyed watching this video, please take the one second that it takes to hit the like button down below. Thank you!